morning, everybody, and uh, really pleased to see all of you. Um, I would say to you that Exit has been on a journey to transition to a low carbon economy over many years. And I think it'd be true to say that about a decade ago, as austerity uh, was brought in, we realized as a city, we couldn't rely on government alone to help us make that transition. We would need to deal with local issues and we would need to build collaboration across the city with our institutions to address what is a compelling um, case that we need to uh, address. And um, I would say that very early on, we realized that the outcomes that were important to the city, both in terms of delivering on carbon, but also making a great city, required the institutions of the city to pull together and for public and private sectors to work jointly in pursuit of building a stronger city. We worked uh, over this decade to build that relationship, that collaboration that we now start to see uh, within the city. And it's culminated in a vision that has been uh, signed off, which is a Exeter Vision 2030 statement. And what that does is position the city in terms of not only the issue of clean growth, which I'll come to, but also to the kind of city we want to create, which is one which is more inclusive, more sustainable and more healthy as a city. And to do that, we all need to pull in the same direction. And so the issue of carbon for us in tackling carbon is really important to also the type of city we want to create. So issues like, for example, encouraging active lifestyles and active travel help us help with the behavioral issues associated with how we get around in the city and how we deal with transport. And the uh, vision statement makes a very clear commitment to a, zero, a net zero exit by 2030, which is a very ambitious uh, goal, but one which the institutions across the city have signed up to in that statement. Now, clean growth is, is one people ask, well, what does it mean? I think I've taken my own view of that very simplistically, which has been, we grow by decarbonizing uh, the, the, the city and, and um, for me in particular, it's always been about how does the city support a transformational economic agenda, which differs from what we've done in the past. And very simply for me, that has always been about how do we capitalize on two of the significant anchor institutions which exist in the city, the Met Office and our University of Exeter, which have a world-class reputation for research in the areas of climate change and environment. And how does a city like Exeter therefore benefit by those institutions that research, stimulating innovation, stimulating, stimulating more uh, entrepreneurial behavior and creating economic growth, but at the same time, absolutely being very focused on that environmental impact. Now, today we have an opportunity to explore what clean growth means in the context of the building back recovery strategy that has been published. Um, it's come out of the work of the Liverpool Exeter Place Board, which means that as we come out of the pandemic, we want to build back in a resilient fashion that is consistent with our aspirations on environment. It's an opportunity for us today to explore um, what will be required from both our residents, our organizations to bolster confidence in the city to make investment decisions in the change that is required if we're gonna deliver this ambition for 2030 and to really capitalize on the opportunity prevent, uh, presented by COVID-19. I mean, the change that has happened, for example, in places where people work has been absolutely profound and the pace of change has accelerated beyond what anyone I think could have imagined just over a year ago. So I'm really excited today about the panelists that we've brought together. And I would like just to take a moment just to introduce the panelists and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to see them uh, on the screen very shortly. So we have uh, Rachel Sutton, the deputy leader of the city council and portfolio holder for Net Zero Exeter 2030. Glenn Woodcock, Glenn is a founder of uh, Exeter City Futures and Global City Futures. He's a great supporter of our city's institutions and he has uh, over 25 years experience of banking and venture capital. And uh, as a director of Oxygen House has been a, a massive investor in renewables. 
Carl Kidan Legacy is the MD of Sancho's, a social entrepreneur working to deliver scaling businesses that are environmentally sound and socially inclusive. Paul White. Paul founded eCulture Solutions in 2010 to deliver digital innovation, change and transformation solutions for social benefit. Paul is passionate about social enterprise and director of Essence, which is stimulating and growing social economy across Devon. Tony Graham. Tony has written on people powered prosperity. He's an executive director for Southwest Mutual and has been supporting local councils working through the problems of finance where traditional banks don't meet our needs. Joanne Kane. Joanne is MD of Cathedral Appointments, Vice Chair of Exeter Chamber of Commerce, and is very focused on skills and, recruit and recruitment. Gary Nicholson. Gary is the global and EU CEO of Hydrogen, Hydro Star, a company that produces low cost industrial level hydrogen and operates in many parts of the world. Gary has been 10 years at Hydro Star, before which he was a CEO of Pegasus AI and spent 15 years as director with Rolls Royce. And our final panelist, David Ralph, the CEO of the Heart of the Southwest Local Enterprise Partnership. David has been absolutely instrumental in the production of the productivity strategy, the local industrial strategy for the Heart of the Southwest, and the recovery plan, which weaves clean growth right through our industrial strategy and the recovery plan. Now I'm gonna ask all panelists to address three questions. The first, what should Exeter look like as we emerge from the pandemic? How does this align with the clean growth ambitions and what does it mean for net zero? Secondly, what does clean growth mean for their business? What commitments or investments will they be making and over what time frame? And thirdly, what do they need from us, the residents, businesses and investors in the city to identify and deliver clean growth and the opportunities this provides Exeter? I'm gonna start by turning to my boss, Rachel Sutton. Rachel? Thanks, Kareem. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, this is both a really exciting time and I think a really terrifying time for um, everybody uh, across the globe, um, because as well as uh, dealing with, with, I think I get the sense we were starting to get our heads around the challenge of the climate emergency and the need to decarbonise. Um, at the point at which um, we got overwhelmed by um, the pandemic. Uh, and I think the, um, the danger, the challenge, but also the opportunity um, is that the climate emergency hasn't gone away um, while we've all necessarily been uh, trying to get our heads around um, the day-to-day -day realities of um, living uh, in the middle of a, of a pandemic. So to, uh, to start by looking at um, the, the questions that the Kareem's out, outlined. The vision from the City Council um, is to actually make the city, make Exeter a better place, a better place to live, a better place to work, um, a better place uh, to visit. And as, as Kareem suggested, we, we started on this, I probably think most elected councils um, would, would say they had similar views for their organisations. And we did start on this journey um, quite some while ago. And some of the, the results of that are, um, are visible now. As you go around the city, you can actually see the passive house council housing that we have delivered. Um, they're, they're popping up now um, across the city. And if you've driven down Heavy Tree Road, you will actually see the leisure centre um, which is, has now actually got glass in the windows. Um, so that is, is a, a reality and that is really exciting. That's a really exciting time for the, the city. Um, what you won't yet be seeing um, is some of the work around the council housing stock where we're, we're trying to retrofit 
uh, houses to actually make them more climate ready, more energy efficient, and to tackle fuel poverty. Um, and I think the challenges are, do the people who live across Exeter really understand the magnitude of changes in their lives that need to happen if we are actually going to address the climate emergency? Um, and I think a lot of people uh, on this call probably do, but there are thousands of people out there um, who probably don't yet. So my vision is to make this the attractive solution, make this what people want because they understand how it's going to change their lives. And what that actually means is that housing is going to be different. Um, there's going to be more of it in the city centre. Uh, it's probably going to be higher um, than people are used to, and it's probably going to be uh, at a greater density uh, than people are used to seeing. When we build it, it's going to be energy efficient, um, healthy buildings, um, passive house buildings, and we hope that other people will follow on. And we also intend to actually make sure that people living in our council housing stock um, have, as, as I've said, got houses that are fit for purpose. And then transport. I mean, transport is the real biggie, isn't it? Everybody agrees that, that we, need, um, we need better air quality. Um, if we change, if we had a fleet of buses that were electric buses, everybody would say that was a great idea. Um, and I would say it's a great idea. But I've had a look at the comments um, that have popped up around the consultation the county council are doing about putting electric charging points on streets um, in the last couple of days. And while there are people who are saying, yeah, this is great, there's a whole bunch of other people are going, yeah, but this is residence parking. You know, we're not going to be able to park our cars if people are parking there to charge their cars. And anyway, they're all going to get vandalised and they look ugly and we don't want them in our bit of town. We think it's a great idea, but not where we live. So that really is the challenge to, to actually convince people that this is the right thing to do for them and that they will want to do it because we have to take people with us on this journey. Uh, we, we can't make people <laughs> sign up for things. Um, so really what I'm hoping from today is, is to actually hear examples where this has worked, where we can, and also for us to take our examples of good practice out there and show people. Uh, and we know people living in passive houses absolutely love them. Um, I know, because I've been to one, that when you've been in a swimming pool that actually has better quality water and is in a um, healthy building, the whole experience of that leisure centre will be entirely different. But those are the stories we need to tell. We need to be putting those stories out there so that people listen to the positives um, and aren't just thinking that my bit of the city isn't going to look the same or my job isn't going to be the same. Um, or my transport options aren't going to be the same. So I think I'll probably leave it there because I know there's a lot of other other speakers, yeah. but those are the um, those are the, the things that I kind of want to put put out there rather than giving you a list of all the great things the city has done because we have done some great things, but a lot of other people have as well. And I, and I think Rachel had very clear the challenge that we have in convincing people this is what is needed and once more, we're going to have to make this change and you 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 are well aware of of how difficult it is to change local behavior and attitudes but that's clearly the a focus um glenn can i ask you the same questions that we put to rachel i'll i'll try to cover them kareem um i i think this is um it's quite it's quite a tough um tough brief actually in three minutes <clears throat> yeah. um um, but I'll, I'll do do my best, and and I, I'm I think I'm going to try not to sound too dramatic as well. But I, I'm I'm not sure whether I'll succeed in that either. Um, <clears throat> I think the, I mean it's worth kind of just thinking back to before, um, before COVID, uh, where we were already facing some really incredibly profound economic challenges. There's <clears throat> there there'd been the, the 
over over the last 30 years there's the there's and i'm not going to list them all but there was the data transformation of our economy so the growth of companies like google and facebook and and, and you're seeing now you know a, a, you know, when I was a kid, there were no mobile phones um, and you had to dial like, like that. So it, the change that's swept through our economy driven by, by, by data is, is really incredible. And the impact it's having on our economy is still washing through and will continue to wash through for decades to come. Um, we've, got, we've had 30 years of profound growth in asset prices. Um, and that has driven inequality in our in our economies, which is frank, frankly is is unacceptable. Um, <clears throat> so the, the the multiple between you know people's earnings and the cost of a house has ha, has got has gone beyond what it what I think we can tolerate in a in a in a modern economy, and we have to do something about that. Uh, and that's only being exacerbated, I think, by by COVID. Um, we've got Brexit. <clears throat> um, and but and probably most profoundly, we've got the growing clarity in what is what is actually more than just a crisis in our in our atmosphere in, in global warming, but is is um, you know is a, is a is a catastrophe which is emerging in in pretty much every single one of our um, of our ecosystems and our ecologies. So in our seas, in our soils, in our air. Um, in in um, in plant life and in animal life that supports us, <clears throat> um, and but I think that and the pandemic, like a brutal and relentless hurricane, has stripped back the our, our economy to really reveal these structural weaknesses in a way which you know we couldn't possibly have imagined. So we are we're at a an incredible moment in our in our history. Um, <clears throat> And it's it's challenging us, and it's challenging us in in literally every every mechanism in our society. What and how we teach our children and young people, what we eat, how we clothe ourselves, how we build our homes, how we deliver healthcare, how we travel, how we heat our houses, and how we entertain ourselves. We've got to look at them all pretty much from scratch. So, so to try and answer the question, what is clean growth? I think to begin with, you have to say what it isn't. And, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, what it isn't is it is not returning to what we were doing yesterday and continuing to build upon that. It doesn't mean throwing things away, but it means recognizing, it does mean recognizing that we have to make some profound changes. <clears throat> um, uh, now, uh, I think, What's exciting about that is that um, if you look at it from the point of view of, of Exeter specifically, because then the other thing with, when you look at these sorts of with these sorts of challenges and say, well, it's all too much for us, it's all too much for me, um, is actually a place like Exeter is incredibly well placed to really rise up to those. None of us can do lots about every single one of those, but we can all do something about one of them. <clears throat> and in fact, all of us are doing something involved with pretty much with with one of those specific areas of challenge. So it's a it literally this this moment in time, I think, is a call to arms for all of us to harness our creativity, our imagination and our innovation to work out what, you know, Kareem and Rachel have correctly called as a transformation in our economy. <clears throat> the transformation in the economy is not an abstract thing. It is the sum total of all of the changes that we're going to look at in our own in our own lives and the way we run our own businesses. Um, <clears throat> so, and I, and I think that it doesn't have to mean pursuit. It doesn't have to mean regressive. I think it actually means more creativity, more excitement, more connectedness, more togetherness in 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 the future. Of, um, building places which are better more exciting places to live and grow up and raise families, um, but they will be different. And that I think is the most, the most difficult and profound thing for us to accept is that um, our lives will change over the next 10 and 20 years, they have to. Um, but if you look back over the last 10 and 20 years, they have been changing anyway. 
So it's not something to, to resist or be afraid of, but something I think that we have to embrace. <clears throat> and, uh, and as I say, that means capturing the, the, the creativity and the excitement in the individuals in our city. And, and what is great about this call is literally every person who is, you know, I feel like I know everyone pretty much on this, on this call. And many of them are already doing these things I've been talking about. They're all, you know, and, and so clean growth is putting, is giving power to the elbows of the people here to em employ more people, to, to, to inspire others to follow in their footsteps um, uh, and, you know, and, to, and to really you know, um, bring as, as much energy and excitement to, to responding to these challenges as we, as we possibly can. Um, <clears throat> so I think what, I've, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to choose one specific initiative because I think it's anathema to everything I've just said. I, I think it is about all of us finding ways in which we can contribute to that, to that challenge. Um, and in terms of my organizer, AO, the organization that I, I work for, the organization that I work for, that is my 100% focus. So you're on mute, Corinne. I'm going to be told off by the leader of the council now. Um, Cal Kidan, you, you sit on the Liverpool Exeter Place Board. You've been refreshing in your views about the way retailing needs to change in the city centre. I want to put to you the same question. What should Exeter look like after we emerge from this pandemic? How does it align with the clean growth ambitions and what does it mean for net zero? And you can go on and address the other issues if you like as well. Thank you, Kareem. Um, so I'll start off by saying that I am an optimist. Um, I believe that there is a huge demand for change in the city um, and a huge kind of resource base from which that change can come. Um, I ha have struggled with my optimism this past year, especially, you know, last year was really difficult for independent businesses and for retailers and high street shops. Um, so, you know, we saw overnight a hundred percent drop in our business and we had to adapt. And what last year was for me is a lesson in the like the true um, potential of the adaptability of my business and those in you know the Four Street Network in particular. So we took a digital focused approach. Um, for those who don't know what my business is, we specialize in sustainable fashion. We took a digital focused approach that served both our local customers here in Exeter, but also our national customers too. Um, in doing so, we're able to open up to a much larger market in a much more efficient business model. And over the course of the year, um, not only did we win an award for being the you know, best high street shop in the UK, which is amazing, um, but also we saw an over 50% increase in our net profits. And I think that what's really important as we plan for you know, Exeter's, Exeter's net zero future is that we, we look to the economies that have a lot of potential. And you know, the digital economy is one in which there is you know, a huge amount of potential and many of the businesses in the city are able to um, access it with the necessary upskilling. And I think there needs to be support from the council to enable business owners, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to really engage in the green and digitized economy. So there's been some talk about um, you know, what the capacity for change is, whether people are conscious of the changes they need to make. And I would argue in our networks, you know, there absolutely is, but there are some challenges. Like, so for example, one of the new, um, the new areas in which Sanchez is developing is we are creating a circular platform for retailers that should enable circularity for tens of thousands of retailers. Um, and give them incentive to be more sustainable. But in order to do so, we need core skills in technology. So we need, um, you know, software developers, full stack developers um, to help us deliver this product. And although there is, you know, a lot of support in the city for it, what there is is an absence of, you know, a, um, a wide, widely skilled, populace that could help us with this um, with this venture 
and particularly a access to um, you know early point um, technicians so there's a lot that could be done to make sure that the skill sets in the city are appropriate for the, um, the, the economies of the future that can generate the most growth in a sustainable way. I think there are some other micro issues to discuss as well. So there is a need in um, the local food companies for a localized delivery service, a green delivery service. And there is a huge opportunity there um, that can be supported by the council. I think what is really important for strategists as they're planning for you know the green future of the city is understanding the the avenues in which the stakeholders well the the, the actors become stakeholders particularly in incentivizing businesses and individuals to take part in the economy and the focus in that way i think can be on you know where growth opportunities are um, i also think it's really important that we don't take a one size fits all approach um, so we've discussed things like sacrifice, responsibility, um, but it's, you know, the final thing I'd like to speak on is the needs of diversity and inclusion as we plan for the future of the city. So environmental sustainability won't be achievable without an intersectional overview. Um, so when we ex imagine these green jobs, like who are we imagining them for? Um, who gets to innovate in this space? You know, who doesn't? and who has been limiting innovation in the space up till now you know you know one of the reasons we're not seeing you know more progress in the green economy is it doesn't serve everyone's interests um, and of course uh, over time that will change um, and we've seen that already but do we understand what the opposing forces are um, and are we able to really address them and tackle them um, we've described the need for denser living environments, but have we also described the people who would be expected to live there? You know, who, who is going to be making these sacrifices and why? Um, and as we expect them to make those sacrifices, are we, you know, effectively encouraging or rewarding them for taking on, you know, more burdens than others are prepared to do? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we've had a really good year. Um, that year has been enabled through, you know, our ready kind of digitization of our business. We want to progress and digitize further. We see a huge opportunity in the circular economy in particular for retail. Um, although we have avenues to grow that, and we've already invested a hundred thousand pounds in that um, in the region to answer the question of investment. I think for future growth, um, skill sets are going to be a challenge locally. And, you know, I, I think it's really important that we, as we kind of take a you know, wider focus off Sanchez and describe long-term sustainability for the region, we're, we're making sure that that's an intersectional inclusive strategy. And um, Rachel mentioned earlier, you know, how can this process be more accessible? And I'd like to give an example of something we do at Sanchez. So at Sanchez, we have a transparent pricing model for a huge range of our products. So our products are organic, they're fair trade, they're sustainably produced, um, they're lower carbon, if not zero carbon. But because of that, they come with a higher price point. And if we were only to sell all of our products at that higher price point, it would immediately exclude a huge portion of our potential customer base. So instead, we have a tiered pricing structure that allows people to access the products at prices that they can afford. And that not only gives us access to a wider market, but it means that we can you know, enable people to be involved in circular, circularity and sustainability, like despite their income status. And I think that's a really important part of the strategy that I'd like to see um, you know, centered in all of our plans. So our plans collectively, but also you know, with the individual organizations that we run to. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of the points you've raised are being picked up in the chat line. Uh, a lot of people coming back. So I'm sure that will be a, a rich source of, of, of comment and further things to bring uh, back in, in the next session. Um, Paul, can I now turn to you? Uh, you got a particular insight from your work with the social enterprises. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yes, I'm, I, I occupy a, a somewhat unusual space here, I think, in the context of representing Essence, and Essence representing the social enterprise industry across the city of Exeter. Um, in particular, uh, we have an initiative that we started some months ago that we're progressing 
focused on mobilizing Exeter's community entrepreneurial spirit. And, and that is looking at actually how we broaden engagement across the whole of the not-for-profit sector, um, recognizing that it is actually a very substantial sector to engage with. And indeed, it's a sector that is directly engaging with our communities uh, at, at the grassroots level and is able then to potentially exert influence into those communities directly in terms of how they develop. Um, and to give you a quick sort of summary of what the not-for-profit sector looks like just for Exeter, and there are over 600 charity, voluntary community and social enterprise organisations. Uh, they have a combined turnover in excess of 300 million uh, and they utilize resources of people, people resources in the region of uh, 12,000 people. That's 6,000 on an employed basis and 6,000 on a voluntary basis. So um, they actually have an enormous reach within our communities. Um, and what we're finding and what the pandemic has exposed is actually that the level of benevolence within those communi communities is, is enormous. We've seen an enormous number of people step forward to offer services and support to people in need. We've seen um, new entrepreneurs, innovators come forward with solutions to address social challenges. And, and those include ecological challenges as well as well-being challenges. And um, we're seeing a movement within the communities themselves towards um, that more contributory and benevolent approach in how they start to solve problems for themselves. How do they start to recognize the challenges that they have, both ecological, economic, uh, where they live, environment, all those sorts of things, and how they um, can actually start to influence and lead change themselves. So we've got a, a great opportunity as a result in front of us. And certainly from an essence perspective, we have ambitions to, um, help achieve greater degrees of sustainability across that benevolent structure. So help people transition from being um, at a voluntary point to a grant funded support point to ultimately becoming a self-sustaining business that's operating within the circular economy ambitions that, um, that, that, that a lot of people have. Um, we are connecting with lots of different organizations that are supporting that industry of, of not for profit of the not for profit sector and indeed have reached into the recovery groups uh, that have been run at Devon and at extra levels to uh, look at how we can better support those industries and um, our ambitions going forward are to see um, growth in that circular economy type structure look at how we can um, help anchor institutions on a social value act perspective in terms of procuring more locally so that we actually support the cooperatives, those um, industries that are producing goods and services across the city um, so that we can increase economic growth, but in that sustainable way. Um, and certainly a theme uh, that we're driving forward in our engagement and development of that sector is the corporate social responsibility. Can we encourage all of the social enterprises out there to start to adopt a, a, a green agenda and in their engagement with the local communities, help translate those messages down to the lowest point within our society so that we actually are able to secure greater buy-in um, from the people. And um, we're very optimistic about the future. I think the, the bonus of the pandemic, as horrible as it has been, is that it has exposed that benevolence that exists within our society. Um, and I'm, I'm mindful of a point that I saw many, many years ago in the NHS strategy, um, five year forward, where they said um, they'd identified 1.4 million carers out there that they needed to be reaching out to in a better way, better way. And I challenged that because in reality, if you take the working age population and they're all mothers and fathers and sons and daughters, do they not care? You know, there's 48 million people. If we take Devon, that's 800,000 people. It's half a million for the city of Exeter. Um, everybody cares. We're all here caring. I think it's a question of how do we enable people to care better? How can we support them to care better? And um, certainly the not-for-profit sector uh, offers that reach and that ability to connect. And then through that, I think, understand individual needs and see how we can better service those needs, but at the same time, increase the education around the broader issues that we have, the broader ecological concerns that we're 
you know, looking at addressing today. So uh, that's me. Paul, Paul, really thank you for that contribution. And it, again, it, what it does is shines a light on something that perhaps I am guilty of, which is at times there are the, um, those components of what makes an inclusive society and what is needed to really build this kind of agenda, uh, which often gets little attention compared to other aspects of our, our, our uh, economy. And, and that's a great powerful reminder of, of the role you play. And in a similar vein, I wanna to go to talk to Tony now, because Tony has been working hard on finance as, as a real, uh, can be a real barrier to achieving what we want to achieve. And, and Tony, if I can ask you to address the issues uh, with your unique input. Thank you, Kareem, uh, very much. Yes, so uh, for those that don't know Southwest Mutual, we are in the process of applying for a banking license uh, for a purpose-led and customer-owned bank for the southwest of England. And part of our purpose is to try and redirect finance to support this um, huge transformation, which I think as previous speakers have, have, have emphasized, I mean, this is, this is not business as usual with a bit of the carbon taken out. You know, this is a major change in the way that we live and do business. But, but I also do think that that can be an exciting transformation that takes us to a much better place. So I, I think overall, I feel optimistic about it. Now, what, however, I do want to start with one point, which I, which I know seeing some of the people that have come into the room um, in the participants, somebody's going to raise sooner or later. And that is uh, whether clean growth is itself a useful frame. I mean, clean growth is a strategy, I think, for achieving something. But I quite like, I think it's important that we keep our eyes on what it is we are trying to achieve. In other words, what is the actual goal? So if the goal is higher standards of living, it's healthy, it's all of these things are described in the plan. I'm not saying they're not, uh, and a lot of the actions are happening. But um, I think we've been a bit obsessed by economic growth in this country and many countries over the last few decades. And actually growth doesn't necessarily raise incomes, particularly at the lower level. In fact, it's been proven not to in many places. It doesn't necessarily raise standards of living, and it certainly has not been compatible with environmental sustainability. So I just wanted to put that out there, and I'll come back to that just at the end on how we talk about things. But in terms of um, what Exeter could look like, I think as a as a as a uh, establishing a bank, you know, this is quite real for us because we have to make decisions about who to lend to with you know, with Exeter people's savings uh, once we get our license, and so we really need to be. Um, uh, pretty precise about where the opportunities for, for growth in particular business models are, where certain other business models are frankly going to have to go into a managed decline. You know, and I think we need to be brutally frank with ourselves that this transformation means that where there are huge opportunities for some businesses, other businesses are going to find their existing models redundant over time. And they need to be thinking now about how they're going to adapt to these changes. And as a bank, we want to be the ones that help people through that transition. So, for example, um, you know, we, traffic's been mentioned, of course, about Exeter, <laughs> but I think there's a question about what is the, the realistic scale of ambition. I take Rachel's point about what the public's actually ready, ready for, but is it not just that cars need to not be fossil fuel, they should be electric, or is it actually the end of the car as the primary means of transport in a sector, in a city like Exeter? I was really interested to see Paris's ambitions for the turning the whole of the Champs-Élysées into a, a, a sort of beautiful, you know, uh, pedestrianised avenue with no cars. Um, I think that's an exciting vision. So I, I'm, I would just say that I, I, you can imagine, um, and Exeter City Futures have done this work, of course, with people. And I think you can paint these visions, which are quite radically different. And here I mean, you know, the primary mode of transport in the city is fossil fuel free public transport. It is not your own car, electric or not as just one sort of point to us with scale of change. So what that means, just for a banker, that means I don't want to lend any money to buy a fossil fuel car. And so to get onto the second point about what this means for our business, um, and, and here I'm going to make some comments which apply to all banks, actually. They might be a bit slower to get there than we want to, but they will get there. I'm a member of a national commission called um, Banking on a Just Transition. And this is trying to grapple with what regulators have said to banks, which is you need to understand the risks to your business from the from this net zero transition uh, and the risks of climate change. And the risks of climate change are of course, physical risks, 
So, you know, increasing flooding may be a risk to certain properties or certain other businesses. We might have more disruption. But also there's something that they call transition risk. And I've already talked about this. And that's the risk that certain business models simply become obsolete and no longer have a market. Um, and I think that that, uh, I think that, you know, for us, that means that, um, you know, we, we really are going to be seeking to put credit and finance behind those sectors that we need a lot more of. I mean, I think, and another one that I have to point to where a massive change I think is needed is in retail. Um, I think, frankly, we are just going to have fewer shops and people are going to buy less stuff. Now the stuff they buy, I think will be, will be better and longer lasting, but that will free up space in the city center for other uses and that maybe that's not a, such a bad thing. So although that's scary, and I certainly empathize as a former retailer, by the way, I used to run, used to run a retail business. I mean, I, I, I hate to see any business lose business or go out of business, but these changes are going to happen. We need to prepare for them. We have been doing some uh, survey work. We, uh, we just did some opinion research um, of people across the Southwest. Um, they were just did before Christmas, 57% say that as a result of the pandemic, they want to shop more locally. 47% say they want to shop more ethically and sustainably. Wow, you know, that's an amazing opportunity for businesses that are willing to embrace that. But there will be other businesses, you know, maybe national chain businesses, maybe those that are not interested in, in you know, social responsibility, they're gonna lose out. So to, to wrap up, um, I think that if there's a call to action, I think that I'd like, what I'd like to say is, everyone should think in terms of, of purpose. Um, so I think a more useful frame than growth is purpose. We need a purpose-led economy. If you're running a business, you need to understand what the wider purpose of that business is. As a bank, our purpose is not to grow profits every year. That's a sign of success and it's absolutely necessary, but it's not the reason why we're here. And, and throughout every activity that happens in the economy, I think that's the most important and fundamental question we need to ask ourselves is what is our purpose? Is it socially and environmentally beneficial? Because if it isn't, we need to stop doing that and do something else, which is socially and environmentally beneficial. Thanks very much. Tony, thank you very much. Again, somebody who has stimulated a lot of chat on <laughs> chat feed, uh, in particular, interest in whether or not the, uh, the clean growth is a, is a useful uh, reference. And I'm sure David Ralph will come to that when he when he addresses it uh, in the context of what's coming out nationally as well from government. But if I can turn out, can I turn to Joanne Kane from the Chamber of Commerce? Joanne? Hi, thank you, Kareem. Um, so I'm sort of wearing three hats today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit from cathedral appointments, so recruitment focused. Um, also from the Chamber of Commerce, so a, a bit of a business focus, um, and also from the skills group, so skills focused. Um, and I think I'm not going to repeat some of the points that have been made, so I'll, I'll try and keep mine more around those, those three areas and probably more around the two areas of recruitment and skills. Um, so firstly, I'll, I'll say I'm Exeter born and raised. I'm very passionate about Exeter, and I'm very passionate about ensuring that Exeter continues to have a thriving economy as we come out of this um, COVID pandemic, and that it's a, a great place for everybody to, to live and of course to work in the future. Um, so I think it's difficult for me to, to answer what will Exeter look like and how will it align to the strategy as such, but um, what, I do, what I do believe is that the big demand for growth and change across the business community um, Exeter has been and um, will always remain resilient to change, um, but I think we need to, to balance um, our ambition, um, particularly as we come out of this pandemic and businesses adapt to different working practices. Um, I, I think that this is the, the start of a journey um, if we're going to achieve net zero by um, 2030. Um, so I think the drive needs to come from the business community um, and also the community in general. We need to ensure that everybody buys into this. Um, there will be opportunity um, for renewable companies to, to drive this. Um, however, I do feel that there will be a big 
skills shortage um, and we're, we're, we're used to skill shortages we've generally got them be them be them around technology sk skills digital skills we're going to have an even bigger skill shortage moving forward um, and I, the, the business community needs to address that skill shortage and they actually need to understand what training is available um, and that needs to have joined up communication with our schools, with our education um, and, and the business leaders throughout. Um, if the skills are available, that is going to open up plenty of opportunity for growth and the creation of jobs. And um, the, the jobs market has already started to, to change as more clean growth, uh, clean growth jobs are being created and this will continue to grow. And this in turn will have a, a job multiplier effect. Um, and there will be more jobs created across, uh, let's say construction, farming, food processing, the healthcare sector, and just uh, commerce in general. Um, the, the action plan for the, the skills strategy this year will have a, a clean growth um, agenda throughout. Um, and will be considered in all of the projects that we're actually involved with. Um, and I, ca I can just see that other organisations, for example, the Chamber of Commerce, will want to pick up and drive forward all of the communication on that. Um, I think as we come out of the pandemic um, and companies look to return to some form of um, normality, the, the the, the clean growth agenda is going to need to come to the forefront of those businesses. And I think in terms of what do we need from the, 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 the council, from, from yourself, I, I think it's more of a, a need for education. What do companies need to do? Um, and you know, how, how do they go about doing that? What resources are needed? Um, and how can, how can we all collaborate together join up and actually drive it forward. I can't think of a conversation I've had around business where skills hasn't come up as a as a major aspect that we need to address. And I think it was referred to by the panel speakers as well. And it's absolutely key to building a, a successful economy that we address that issue. Um, can I now go to Gary Nicholson? Gary from Hydrostar. Um, I'm not going to do your introduction, Gary. You know, I'm a big fan. Just get on with it. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, my name is Gary Nicholson. Um, I've lived in Exeter, probably getting on for nearly 10 years. Um, I've not done much business in Exeter. I've not done much business uh, with um, Exeter as a city. Um, but um, I think that the COVID-19 uh, virus has meant that because I'm in the UK, I touched base with uh, Ben Bradshaw and then on to Karim. And Karim and I have been talking about different things for probably getting on now for about nine months. Um, who am I? Um, I can tell you my background, but it's all in LinkedIn. Just look me up. I'm a founder of several environmental businesses. And my business are based predominantly in Asia. That's China and Singapore. USA, mostly on the West Coast uh, in and in Australia. The technologies that um, we have are all environmental technologies, things that will reduce emissions uh, and reduce um, fossil fuel usage. Um, I'm working on, in particular, a large project in Tasmania. Tasmania to me is extremely similar to, to Devon. It's um, a green agricultural place, um, not well known for manufacture, you know, all of those sort of things. And there's a lot of parallels between what I'm doing in Tasmania and what I'd like to see done in Exeter. I'm blunt, straightforward. And, you know, uh, although I'm a very strong environmentalist, I believe in practical, practical steps being taken to achieve practical results. Uh, I'm an ex-director of Rolls-Royce. Uh, project management of things like nuclear power plants need, need uh, very, very tight planning and achieving objectives. And I think that's something of what we need to do uh, if we're gonna see Exeter succeed. So Tasmania is reinventing itself. Um, it's planning to come out of COVID 
Um, uh, I mean, it was planning it before that, but um, Tasmania is reinventing it as a green technology hub. They're looking at generating a lot of green hydrogen from uh, solar, from wind, uh, other, uh, other power, uh, and then exporting that um, green hydrogen around the world. They basically want to be the Saudi Arabia of, uh, of Southeast Asia. Um, they've already set up uh, pathways into Singapore and pathways into Japan. Um, I think um, I'd like to see uh, a green technology hub in Devon, in Exeter. As far as I'm aware, there's people playing around with green energy, in, uh, green technologies in the UK, but there aren't many places that, that could call themselves a real uh, green technology hub. Um, we manufacture technology that uh, basically takes water and makes hydrogen. It's an electrolyzer company. There's only one other company doing that in the UK at any great size. And so um, I was trying to work out with Karim whether I should bring that technology to, um, to Devon, uh, to Exeter. And um, we're in a fundraising round right now. So I'd certainly be interested uh, to talking to... Uh, anyone that's uh, gone through that process. We're looking to raise, and we're raising uh, around about 50 million right now, uh, which would be used in projects in the UK. And um, so what does clean growth mean for Hydrostar? It's a good question. Um, how about everything? Uh, we are an environmental technologies business. It's the lifeblood of our team. It's the lifeblood of its investors. Our investors are people that don't just believe in the, in the environment being altered, but they actually put their hand in the pocket and put money on the table to, to try and make it happen. The two technologies I have, uh, or, or that um, I'm a founder of, is, number one is Hydrostar, which is, um, like I've just said, a green hydrogen production uh, company. Um, I'm not necessarily believing that uh, Devon um, or indeed Exeter is the right place to manufacture electrolyzer units. Um, I think the skill gap might be too big, but um, that's anyway, one business that we have, we would certainly be looking at setting up our research and development um, arm here uh, and potentially our headquarters. The other technology that we have is a company called SmartH, and uh, that basically uses AI to reduce vehicle emissions. And so it's a big comp component part for the smart city strategy. And this year already, we've had two Innovate UK awards. We had an early um, uh, 50K from Innovate UK at the start of the year. And we just received another 100K probably about uh, two months ago. Um, as I said, we've got some very large investors who are willing to back Hydrostar, um, particularly in a green technology strategy. I'm, I'm talking to Anybody and anybody, anybody and everybody in the city who are interested in, in being involved with, with large projects. Um, but the investors that we have need to see a plan and they need to see what, what we, uh, the UK, Devon, and focus down onto Exeter are willing to do. What do we want to do? If we want, um, for example, hydrogen vehicles in this city, and uh, I'm not a proponent of hydrogen or a proponent of uh, electric vehicles. I, either is okay for me. But hydrogen you particularly need for large vehicles. So trucking and those sort of things need hydrogen. Uh, you can't build electric trucks yet. Um, but where would we go and fill up if we had a hydrogen vehicle right now? If Karim said to me, hey, Gary, we want to go for zero carbon emissions on all of our uh, refuse collection trucks, for example. There is no filling station here. And that's part and parcel of what uh, Karim and I are talking about. Um, call to action. Uh, this is where I have to be very blunt, guys, because I'm, I'm a, you know, a Yorkshireman. It's, um, it's, it's in my lifeblood, that just, to, just to tell you as it is. You need practical, measurable steps of what Exeter is trying to do. Who's responsible for that step? And how are you going to make that step? Uh, project management. I mean, I think that a lot of things sort of slip through the gaps and you say, oh, oh yeah, I remember. I remember this. I remember that. I remember the other. 
um, ideas shouldn't be slipping through the gaps. There, there are probably a lot of people in this city who aren't in this meeting because they've probably had an experience that you know they tried something before, it didn't happen last time. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen this time, but, but we shouldn't be allowing ideas and um, you know the lifeblood of any organization is its people. We have some fantastic people in Exeter uh, that we should be making better use of. Gary, yep. I'm sorry, I've, I've got to cut you short now. I'm being yep, told sure off right. by my other co-chair no for being absolutely abysmal with timekeeping. Yeah, no problem. Um, mate. Thank you very much. But I, okay, I, I, I juxtapose, just, just, I put you next to uh, David for a reason, really. Okay. Uh, David's going to wrap up now. David, um, your, your, your position is a little bit different from the others in terms of your strategic overview for the region. Uh, but there was a, a very specific aspect that I was really interested in terms of what you've heard in terms of the clean, clean growth agenda and what is needed, what do we need to support that. And, and you've got some very clear messages there from Gary in terms of what the region needs to do to help support that. But if we could just wrap this up in the next four or five minutes, that would be great. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so just to remind people, the LEP is really responsible for translating government's thoughts into an economic strategy for some, Somerset and Devon. Um, so I spend a lot of time trying to persuade government to do the right things and trying to spend a lot of time trying to then unearth what government is proposing and deliver it locally. And I genuinely think that the South West could be the leading region for delivering low carbon economy. And I genuinely think that Exeter could be at the forefront of leading that region. It's in our hands. If we wait for government to tell us to do it, they'll never get there, partly because they're looking north and they're looking to the Midlands and they will produce very blunt instruments. So that's the opportunity for us. I actually think it will be very difficult to deliver zero net carbon by 2030. And I've seen very little evidence so far of how we're going to do that, a route map, I would probably call it. However, I am absolutely in a place and my board is in a place that we should do it as fast as we practically can. So I want to talk a little bit about drivers. Um, I don't believe clean growth is a destination. I think it is a means to an end. And what we fundamentally said a year ago is that we should deliver an economic strategy that is different. We should uh, actually not focus on growth. We should focus on an equal balance of economic growth, environmental uh, support and protection and social benefit. So we have fundamentally changed from saying we're going to grow for growth's sake to saying that we should hold environmental, social and economy issues to the same degree of measurement and also analysis. So I think it's a departure point. I don't think it's an evolution. I actually think it is a fundamental change. And I think why do we need to do that? is so firstly actually the economy of somerset and devon is underachieving um it is not performed particularly well there's high levels of or there were before covid there are high levels of employment that cover, covers up many sins the biggest of which most people haven't benefited from growth so if we really want a strong economy then all our communities should be benefiting from growth not just some now one of the challenges for exeter is that it bucks that trend so Exeter has done pretty well over the last 10 or 15 years. And that's something that you will need to think about. So actually, I would encourage you to keep going in the same direction that you've been going. And I do recognise you're doing more on clean growth than many. Uh, and I would probably suggest that doubling up your work with the university, because that's your key comparative advantage, is something you should actually really push on. Because why is Exeter doing well? Well, one is it's got a great location. Uh, two, it's got some vision. And three, it's got some pretty important assets, including the university, including the hospital. Um, so doubling up on those institutions. Um, the second is that government definitely, post-Brexit, whether you believe in Brexit or not, was thinking, what does global Britain look like post-Brexit? What's it good at? What does it excel at? And that may be very different from what it's done in the past. So it did some really interesting work through its industrial strategy about what that might look like and some really big challenges and government, not least because we have COP26 later this year, is really focused on being at the forefront and will fund being at the forefront of the clean growth agenda. So there is an opportunity to make propositions into some government money. And the third and by far 
overwhelming uh, challenge is that our communities are expecting us to deliver a low carbon agenda. Now, they may not like change. Uh, they may be reluctant to actually do some of the things they want us to do, but there is no doubt over the last couple of years that our communities and our, civil, uh, our civic agencies are absolutely supporting uh, response to climate change uh, emergency and moving to a more low carbon economy. So there's some pretty powerful drivers uh, in doing that. Um, so what do I think clean growth means? Well, I think it means different things in different places and that's where it can get really confusing. So if you're in red car or Wales or heavy industrial manufacturing areas, and actually you've got heavy pollutants that you really have to decarbonize. That's a big challenge for those. We haven't got a lot of those in the Southwest. So what's really important to us? So the first is energy production. There is no doubt that we could supply all of the low carbon energy for UK PLC in the Southwest. So whether it's uh, nuclear, so we've got a, the only new nuclear power station in Hinkley, whether it's offshore wind, floating offshore wind, we've got lots of solar, we've got quite long term some geothermal stuff, and we've got a conversation which we've just heard about, about hydrogen, and we could play a role in that as well. So we could supply the low carbon energy for UK PLC. I don't actually think Exeter is particularly well placed in that. I think that it is probably other areas, but you will have some supply chain innovation things to drive off the back of that. So there is a conversation. Where I do think Exeter can play a role is reducing demand. So whether it's retrofitting housing, whether it is uh, changing behaviours, uh, then actually I think there is an opportunity to reduce demand for energy. But we need to recognise that in this revolution, that we will probably need two, three or four times the amount of electricity that we currently produce at the moment. So that need for energy is really, really important. The second and really big opportunity for Exeter, which Kareem mentioned right at the start, is around environmental sciences and digitalization. So you are at the forefront with the university and some of your innovation businesses in the area to actually drive through a digital agenda, particularly focused on environmental science and Met Office, UK Hydrographic Office, uh, using our natural capital, whether it's Rothamsted, Exeter, et cetera. So you should absolutely focus on driving forward that agenda around the uh, how we how we use our natural capital uh, in terms of the digitalization agenda and then the third thing which i'm really interested in is around uh, and some people have mentioned it adaptability and agility so we will consume food in a different way we will high streets will be different we need to think about how transport operates etc and certainly a smart city in exeter leading the forefront leading that I think is really, really interesting. So finally, just, just to wrap up, um, what should Exeter look like? You need to adopt your comparative advantages. So the university, your access to natural capital, your digital assets, that's really something that you need to focus on uh, going forward. What does it mean to business? I think it means more collaboration, both across local authorities. I think in response to the COVID team, Devon has done a good job in coming together. Why can't Team Devon move on to delivering low carbon economy and work in the same way? But I think how we work with business, business will drive this, uh, I think is really, really important. Uh, and then particularly, how do we get on the front foot of changing habits? And then finally, what does it look like for Exeter? Well, I think it means about our institutions stepping up and I think it's about leadership. So one of the big challenges here, which has been mentioned, is there will be business models that fail there will be uh, dilemmas for people to say, we're going to spend money on this, but not on something else. That's a leadership challenge. And I'm really hoping, and uh, I think this probably demonstrates it, Exeter's willingness to lead the charge, as well as support others in going forward. Thank you. David, thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, a great roundup.